Hello and welcome to The View from Mayor Brown podcast. This is a fortnightly podcast series for employment lawyers and HR practitioners which highlights developments in case law and legislative changes of importance to UK employers. It is presented by Nicholas Robertson, the head of Mayor Brown's London employment team. The time spent listening to these podcasts can count towards your CPD requirements and at the end of the podcast we will explain how to get in touch if you wish to claim CPD points or if you have any comments or questions. Hello and welcome to podcast number 93 where the odds are rather less than 5,000 to 1 that before the end of the podcast I'll have told you something that doesn't relate to employment law uh, whether it's musical, uh, cultural or whatever. Actually in fact why don't we do the whatever now uh, I'm part way through um, a fantastic book, um, Randall Munro's book called What If, which is serious scientific answers to absurd hypothetical questions. But it features answers to questions such as what would happen if you made the periodic table out of the elements of the periodic table? Um, what's the fastest man-made object of all time? And the answer, in part, is a two-ton metal hatch cover, for reasons that you'll have to read the book to find out. And what would happen if you tried to fly an aeroplane around planets that weren't Earth? I think we can all agree that the world is a richer place for knowing the answers to those questions. Well, here back on planet Earth, planet employment law, um, we have three cases. Uh, whistleblowing, um, uh, for one. Um, a case on whether a staff handbook was incorporated into a contract of employment, which obviously affected what the employers could change unilaterally. And a settlement agreement with unexpected consequences. As usual, please don't forget you can access the podcast via iTunes. Um, it's on the Mayor Brown uh, internet and uh, it's on YouTube and the Twitter feed where we have links Nicholas Robertson at Nicholas R O B E R 11 and um, the links will get posted out at the same time as this podcast goes out. Um, so, first case Department of Transport and Sparks and others. And this is a case on the provisions of a staff handbook dealing with sickness management. The Department of Transport were trying to vary the provisions, and the employees didn't want to agree. And by the time the case reached the Court of Appeal, the issue was simply whether or not the relevant provisions which the Department were trying to change were contractual or not. High Court found the provisions were contractual. The provisions set out in the contract provided expressly, expressly that the handbook terms, um, uh, it said that handbook terms which are apt for incorporation into the contract were deemed to be incorporated into the employee's contract of employment. And this this wording covered absence management policies. And the High Court accepted that clearly Part A of the handbook had been intended to be contractual, and even though Part A included many provisions within that section which were for guidance only, and therefore not apt for incorporation into the contract of employment, it didn't partic- prevent the particular absence management provisions in question being contractual. These in particular related to the number of days of short-term absence which an employee had to have had before it was possible for the employer to commence a formal absence management process. Employer appeals to the Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal rejects the employer's appeal. Uh, The Court went through a number of cases dealing with establishing whether or not provisions contained outside the formal contract of employment are incorporated into the contractual arrangement with the employer. To that extent, it's a useful case if you're having to look at this area because it goes through and summarises a number of the the key points. And what's clear is the starting point is whether or not the relevant provision is apt for incorporation into the contract of employment. That's as a matter of legal test, not just the language in this case. This is obviously going to involve looking at the particular documentation itself and the extent to, to that extent, decisions will often turn on precise facts and language rather than general principles. Here, the contract stated that Quote, it's the intention of the parties that all of the provisions of the departmental staff handbook which apply to you and are apt for incorporation should be incorporated into your contract of employment. Unquote. In addition, it said, quote, the departmental staff handbook is in two parts. Part A contains terms and conditions. All of Part A and all of the annexes of Part A which apply to you and which are apt for incorporation will be incorporated into your contract of employment. Well, the department argued that the trigger provisions were not apt for incorporation because they were inherently unsuitable. The language of the section as a whole was not expressed in terms of entitlement. It said it would make no sense for a particular type of short-term absence to be contractual, while other types of longer-term absences were left flexible. 
Court of Appeal didn't agree. They saw no inconsistency in sickness management procedures generally being a matter of guidance, but with the trigger points at which the formal process could be engaged being a matter of contract. They pointed to the clear wording of the handbook indicating that the terms which were apt for incorporation were intended to be incorporated. The trigger provisions were not a framework within which to approach matters or a framework for discussion which might have taken them outside the scope of what was apt. They were much more specific than that. Therefore, overall, the combination of the precise nature of the promise and the statement and the wording um, in uh, the uh, contract about provisions that were apt for incorporating would be incorporated sank the department's case. I think this is quite an important case. Clearly the wording in the contract, with the benefit of hindsight, could have been much more favourable to the employer. Equally, however, I think it is a good lesson for employers. Merely because a provision is contained within a more generalised set of statements does not prevent a specific provision within it being incorporated into the contract of employment. Conversely, of course, this whole issue could have been sidestepped by having sufficiently clear wording that provisions were not intended to form part of the contract. Such clear wording is very hard to get around, in my experience, if a party is then trying to argue that it does, after all, form part of the contract. So, that's Department of Tra- Tra- Department for Transport and Sparks. Next up, another of those cases where I am undoubtedly going to butcher the name. Uh, the party's names are Canty Mansisk, uh, Recoveries Limited, Canty Ka- being spelled K-H-A-N-T-Y, uh, if you look it up on Google, I'm going to call them KMR for obvious reasons. Now, this isn't an employment case, but it deals with the ambit of a settlement agreement which may potentially have had a wider impact than at least one of the parties anticipated. Now, the background is that the relevant law firm, Forsters, were retained by a company, Ertish, in connection with the purchase of a Russian company, YBI. After three years of working on the transaction, Forsters are replaced by another law firm, and then there's a dispute uh, between the client and Forsters about the payment of invoices for Forsters services. It gets to the stage where, in fact, Forsters issue proceedings to get payment, and a settlement's reached. And the settlement agreement stated that it was, quote, in full and final settlement of all or any claims which the parties have or could have had against each other, whether in existence now or coming into existence at some time in the future, and whether or not in contemplation of, par- of the parties on the date hereof. A claim, in this context, was defined in the agreement very widely as a claim or potential cause of action or right of any kind or nature whatsoever, whether known or unknown, suspected or unsuspected, however or whenever arising, in whatever capacity or jurisdiction, whether or not such claims are in the contemplation of the parties at the time of this agreement, arising out of or in connection with the capital A action or the invoice addressed to Ertish by Forsters. The action, capital A action in this case, was the litigation laws by Forsters. So the settlement agreement had to be something to do arising out of or in connection with the litigation about the invoice or the invoice itself. A couple of years after this, allegations of negligence surface against Forsters. When proceedings are launched, not surprisingly, Forsters deny all liability, and in addition point to the terms of the settlement agreement, which they said prevented any claims in any event. There were various arguments put forward by KMR as to why the settlement agreement wording did not prevent their negligence claims. It was accepted as common ground at this stage of litigation that the only dispute between the parties at the time of the settlement agreement itself was the dispute about the invoice. Neither party had any idea of the allegations which were going to surface a couple of years later. The claimants in this case pointed to the well-known case a few years back, the BCCI case, where, if you remember, settlement agreements concluded between employees and employer at the time the employees left were held not to preclude them from subsequently bringing claims for stigma damages. However, here, the judge was having none of this. He held that the wording protected the claims, prevented the claims from um, proceeding. In relation to the BCCI point, the judge took the view that the claims in BCCI were what he called unknown unknowns. In other words, nobody at that time thought that stigma damages claims were even available for an employee. And it took a subsequent Supreme Court decision to determine that employees had such claims. That subsequent decision came well after the signing of the settlement agreement. So the settlement did not prevent the stigma damages claim. In this case, however, the wording was expressly clear enough to cover claims, potential claims, known, unknown, however and whensoever arising, etc., etc. The wording could hardly have been clearer on this point. And whilst the judge accepted that the negligence claim itself was not suspected on the facts at the time, an objective bystander would not have said that a claim for breach of contract or negligence was impossible. 
Therefore, the BCCI case by itself did not assist the claimant. However, the judge also had to deal with the fact that the settlement agreement expressly said it was a settlement of claims, etc., quote, arising out of or in connection with the capital A action, the litigation of the invoice, um, or the invoice itself. Well, the judge said the term, quote, in connection with, unquote, was wider than the term arising out of. The later dispute over the quality of the services provided by Forsters, negligent or not, was sufficiently connected with the invoice in relation to those services for it to be covered by the settlement. Well, I wanted to mention the case for two reasons. First, I think it's very useful to have express authority, even if it's outside the employment context, which expressly recognises that a full and final settlement agreement wording can cover known and unknown claims, provided the wording is sufficiently clear. And secondly, of course, this is an object lesson in not agreeing to a full and final settlement of all or any claims, unless you do it with your eyes open, and you need to do it. So, that's the KMR and Forsters case. Now, the third and final case, which uh, I may go, I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail than the first two cases, is Kilrain and London Borough of Wandsworth. This is an EAT case dealing with whistleblowing and protected disclosures. I thought it was a particularly useful case um, to um, go through because it raises issues as to what an employee needs to show if they're going to claim they've made a protected disclosure. And it's quite useful to have a sort of factual analysis in this case that it gives us, because you can sort of use it as a yardstick if you're being asked to evaluate whether or not something qualifies as a protected disclosure. Claimant works for respondent. It's an education authority. She's made redundant in September 2011. She asserts that there were four separate incidents where she'd made protected disclosures prior to that and that those disclosures had led to her being made redundant. Now, certainly from the case report, it looks as if she was suspended after making the last of the allegations and kept on suspension until she was made redundant uh, a year or so later. Well, there were four written disclosures. They're all written, which is helpful because we have the precise words used. Four written disclosures occurred in 2005, 2008, 2009 and 2010. The 2005 allegation was found by the tribunal, the employment tribunal, not to be a protected disclosure because it wasn't made to the employer. The 2008 allegation was out of time. The third allegation, the tribunal said, did not qualify because it didn't convey any information. That's the point I'm going to come back to. The fourth allegation failed on that ground and also that the claimant had not articulated what legal duty it was that she said um, that was being broken by the employer or that she reasonably believed there was such a duty. How did she get on at the AT? Well, in relation to the first disclosure, the 2005 disclosure, the Employment Tribunal had rejected this, as I say, on the grounds the disclosure had not been made to the employer. Generally, of course, to be a disclosure, a qualifying disclosure, it needs to be made to the employer um, to gain the necessary protection. However, the AT pointed out there were alternatives that might perhaps have been argued by the claimant. At the tribunal, she had tried to argue the disclosure she was making in 2005 to a particular third party was in accordance with a disclosure procedure authorised by the employer, which is one of the statutory exceptions in the Employment Rights Act. However, that failed on the facts. The AT pointed out, however, she could have chosen to argue that the disclosure to the third party was related to the conduct of that third party itself, which is also another exception to the rule that disclosure tends to need to be made to the employer. However, since she had not advanced this argument in front of the Employment Tribunal, in the view of the AT, they were not prepared to allow her to raise it as a fresh argument at the EAT stage. The second claim had been brought out of time. EAT confirms this. Again, they identified ways in which she might have been able to argue the claim was in time, but since that argument hadn't been run, again, the tribunal were not, the Employment Appeal Tribunal were not willing to allow her to raise fresh arguments on appeal. Well, this brings us to the, what I call the meat of the case, the, the third and fourth disclosures. Underlying this, of course, is the case of Cavendish, Monroe and Gedald in 2009. The EAT in that earlier case had said that it was necessary for a claimant, if it was going to be making a protected disclosure, to be conveying facts. The EAT, in a passage from that earlier case that has been cited in more than one case since, said, quote, In the course of the hearing before us, as a hypothetical example... It was advanced regarding communicating information about the state of the hospital. Communicating information would be the wards had not been cleaned for the past two weeks. Yesterday, sharps were left lying around. Contrast that with would be a statement that you are not complying with health and safety requirements. Unquote. In our view, this, the latter one that is, would be an allegation, not information. 
The EAT in the Kilrain case, this case, suggested it would be right to be cautious about distinguishing between information and allegations. They pointed out the distinction. That distinction is not made in the statute itself. Quote, the question is simply whether it is a disclosure of information. Stop. If it is, and it's also an allegation, that is nothing to the point. Unquote. When applying that approach, well, what happened to the third and fourth disclosures made by the claimant in this case? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, the third disclosure was on the basis of a letter which said, quote, I think it is also important to remind you that what has been achieved over the years has been despite bullying and harassment that was tolerated and at times, not least at present, encouraged over that time. And despite successive and repeated failure to honour agreements to extend my role and to provide clear development. Stop. Since the end of last term, there have been numerous incidences of inappropriate behaviour towards me, including repeated sidelining and all of which I have documented. Unquote. The claimant said that statement provided information. It's talking, of course, about um, sidelining, bullying, harassment recently. Um, well, the AT didn't accept this. It took the same view as the tribunal. It said that the statement, quote, does not sensibly convey any information at all. And moreover, it is difficult to see how what is being alleged amounts to a criminal offence or a failure to comply with legal obligations or any of the other matters to which the statute makes reference, unquote. Quote, it's simply far too vague, unquote. Inappropriate may cover a multitude of sins. It has to show or tend to show something that comes within the section, unquote. So, Bear in mind, this is a letter which expressly refers to bullying, harassment and repeated sidelining. But there's no information provided about that harassment or bullying or sidelining. In relation to the fourth statement, the claimant, again in writing, said, referring to a colleague, quote, she did not support me, as she claims when I reported a safeguarding issue during the same meeting. Stop. Her response, which shocked me, was, quote, I can't comment. I'm never there during the school, only before or after, so I can't comment, unquote. This is repeated belittling, and I tried very hard to engage her as my line manager in the report, unquote. Well, here, the AT accepted that this did make an allegation, and it gave some information about what was said during the meeting, so it qualified as a disclosure. So far, so good. However, they supported the Employment Tribunal's reasoning that the alleged disclosure did not suggest that the person who is being spoken to had any legal duty that was being broken by what she had allegedly said to the claimant. Pulling all this together, I think it does indicate that claimants have to be quite precise about the information they are providing in order to claim the protection of the um, legislation. Of course, information doesn't necessarily have to be correct. They need to reasonably believe it. But there does need to be some detail in the information provided in order to qualify. So I think this is a helpful case for employers and one that claimant advisors obviously ought to be aware of. But if you are looking at a, a disclosure that has been made without advice being taken, I think this case offers a, a roadmap, shall we say, for trying to evaluate whether there is enough information provided to be a qualifying disclosure or not. So that's Kilrain and London Borough of Wandsworth. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and actually, another mention for those who got in touch. We've had a number of people ask about claiming CPD points. Don't forget, you can claim your CPD points for listening to the podcasts. And so people have written in to me asking about how they reclaim these. Please do email me if, if that would be helpful, um, and we can send you out the necessary form and stuff. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm always grateful to those who take the trouble to write in, in any event, as it's good to find out um, some of those who are listening to the podcast, because generally we don't know. And so uh, I'm, I'm always interested and always interested where people are listening. So uh, I think it only remains for me to say in time honoured fashion, I knew Jon Snow was going to come back to life. Um, and um, here's to podcast number 94. Thanks very much. Bye. So that was our latest podcast. We hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or comments or want to know how to claim CPD points, please email nick at nrobertson at mayorbrown.com. Our podcasts are an overview of the cases and how the law applies in any particular case will obviously depend on the individual circumstances. So please take legal advice in if any of the matters discussed are relevant to issues you are dealing with. Thanks for listening.